Hey what is up guys, today we're going to unbox and review the iPhone XS. Alright, so here's the box for the iPhone XS, it's nothing new, it's just the picture of the iPhone up front, iPhone logo on the side, and the Apple logo in this shiny gold color. And yep, yeah, so let's lift up the lid. And we're presented with the design by Apple in California. It's just pretty much our instructions and literature. And we got our Hello Quick Start Guide. And here's something new, it's a SIM ejection tool because the iPhone does support dual SIMs now. We got some warranty stuff and Apple stickers. Great. And here's the iPhone XS itself. I got the 256 gig in gold, obviously. And it's a really nice design here. And we'll put this off to the side for just a quick sec. And inside the box here, we get a 5 watt power adapter. It's not a fast charger, uh, and it's just regular USB. Apple really needs to include a fast charger. Uh, but unfortunately, for a thousand bucks, that's all we get. And we get the Lightning ear pods. And these are wired, of course. And this time around, we do not get a headphone dongle. So that's a shame as well. And of course, just regular Lightning to USB A cable. No USB-C, no headphone dongle, no fast charger. It is what it is. All right, let's put this off to the side. All right, so here's the iPhone itself. And it's a really beautiful design here. And it's a 256 gig in gold. And it's really hard to tell the design difference between the iPhone 10. Uh, the only way you could tell this is the 10s is by that antenna line down at the bottom. And there's a new asymmetric design with the speaker grills, uh, which may be annoying for some people. I don't really mind it. And here on the side, there are volume up and volume down buttons, and the silent to switch. And then here is the camera. Now the actual camera bump in terms of surface area is just slightly bigger than the iPhone X, so some cases may not work, so keep that in mind. And up on top, there's another antenna line above the camera right there. So that's how you could tell it's an iPhone XS. So booting up the device, get that Apple logo on that gorgeous OLED display. Alrighty, so once the iPhone is done booting up, you can just pick it up and raise to wake. And that's a feature I really like. And also, you could just tap the display to wake it up. And Apple did update Face ID to be faster this time around, so you just swipe up and you can see that. Let's try that one more time. You just tap, it recognizes you, and you swipe up. Now the iPhone XS, of course, uses the gesture system, so you just swipe up for multitasking, swipe down on the right for control center, and then you swipe down on the left for notification center. And of course, you just swipe up to go home from any app you're in. And the iPhone XS does also feature 3D touch, which they actually took off the iPhone XR, but it still remains here on the XS, so you just press in, and it's a feature that I actually use a lot, so I hope Apple does not take it off the iPhones, but it's still here. And the iPhone does not have a home button, so if you want to turn off the device, you need to press volume up and the side button to turn it off. And also, to access Siri, you just need to press the side button on the right. And that's how you access Siri now without a home button. And hands down, my favorite feature of the iPhone XS has to be that display. It looks so gorgeous, and Apple calls it a Super Retina HD. It's a 5.8 inch OLED display, and has a resolution of 2436 by 1125, and has 458 pixels per inch. And it also has amazing viewing angles as well, and there's not a lot of blue shifts compared to other smartphones out there. And the display actually goes super bright whenever I'm looking at the screen in direct sunlight, I have no issues. And when you're watching 16 by 9 content, obviously you're going to get some black bars, but if you're in apps like YouTube, you can just pinch in and you can just fill the screen, and it looks really gorgeous. And the display also does support HDR content, so apps like YouTube and Netflix do support HDR. And when you watch that kind of stuff, it looks really good. The colors are so bright and vibrant. They just pop off the display. It's almost like a sticker that's on the screen. And I don't think anyone will be disappointed with this display. And of course, if you want a larger screen, you could just always go with the iPhone XS Max with a 6.5 inch display. And of course, Apple did upgrade the cameras. We do see some minor hardware and software adjustments. So with the cameras, we do get dual 12 megapixel wide angle and telephoto lenses and they're both optically image stabilized and the wide angle camera here has an f1.8 aperture while the telephoto lens has an f2.4 aperture and things look really sharp and with the telephoto lens you can just zoom in for 2x optical zoom 
and it does support digital zoom for up to 10x which i'm not sure why you would want to do that but there you go and a new feature we're getting is the ability to adjust the amount of blur in portrait mode photos after you've taken the shot. So you can see I could adjust the amount of blur in the background. And I actually like this feature, but it looks bad in some photos and really good in others. Because sometimes it could just make it look like it was really poorly photoshopped. And of course we get some different lighting effects, which in my opinion I think look really bad. But for people who want it, it's there. And the big feature with the iPhone XS camera is what Apple calls Smart HDR and I actually have a lot of mixed feelings about it because it looks good in some photos and really bad in others. So here's a photo I took at downtown Seattle where I actually think Smart HDR did a great job. Uh, you can see a lot of details in the sky and in the bottom portion of the shadows. Nothing's really blown out, a lot of detail in the buildings in the background, everything's really well exposed. And there's a lot of fast moving objects here with the cars and you can see the bird in the middle. And with the multiple exposures, Apple did a good job of stitching everything to make it look super sharp. And here's another good example of Smart HDR. And here I'm under a bridge where there's a lot of harsh shadows. But what really is impressive is that little sliver of sky at between the bridge and the parking garage. You could see the blue from the sky is actually maintained and it's not white from overblown highlights. So Apple was managing to stitch a bunch of multiple exposures and it's really impressive the amount of detail you could get from this camera. And here's another shot just to show off the amount of detail you get from the actual lens. It's really sharp from corner to corner. And with this picture, I actually took it with the telephoto lens and things look really good here. You can see the shadows under the stairs. There's a lot of detail that's pulled out with the highlights in the sky still maintained. But now I want to show you where Smart HDR looks really bad. Now here's a photo where I actually found Smart HDR to be too strong. So in while trying to pull out the details and highlights and shadows, you could see the buildings there. It's almost to the point where it loses contrast. So even though it's a well exposed, it's to the point where everything just looks super flat and loses contrast. And the colors almost look a little bit unnatural in this one. Now here's another photo where I think again, Smart HDR is just too strong. It's a sunset photo and I remember this sunset, it was really gorgeous and there's a lot of vibrant colors. But this one, Smart HDR just pushed everything to be a little overexposed while trying to maintain the details in the mountains in the background. And at this point you can see the greens from the grass looks really washed out from trying to pull out the shadows. And it just doesn't look good and everything's really flat. And the same thing applies for this shot. You could see the foreground and the grass and the moss in front of me. The greens look really washed out. And the sky is really well exposed, but you can see the mountain just loses a lot of its contrast and everything again looks dull and flat in this photo. And here's a portrait mode photo that I took. And I think we can all agree that there's a recurring theme with the lack of contrast. Again, you can see Smart HDR just really overdid it with trying to pull out details from the shadows in the background. It's to the point where the greens look really flat and dull in color. And you can just see the skin tones here are just so bad, it's to the point where it looks like it's made out of clay and pastel rather than actual human skin. And again, no contrast, everything just looks so overblown. And it's not a usable shot by any means. And this is literally the only Smart HDR photo that I managed to get that I actually think looks usable. So this time around you can see these skin tones are not overblown like the last one. And a lot of the details of the highlights in the sky you can see there, it's well maintained so you can still see the clouds. And I actually find myself having to turn off Smart HDR a lot and it's even more annoying since you can't adjust the camera settings in the actual camera app. So in order to actually turn off Smart HDR or change any other camera setting, you need to go into the settings app, scroll all the way down to where you find camera, click on that, and from there you can toggle Smart HDR off and adjust your video settings and all that other stuff. And it's honestly really annoying and I think Apple should update it in the next version of iOS. Now the camera does support 4K video at up to 60 frames per second and slow motion video at 1080p at 240 frames per second. And honestly, I have no complaints with video this time around. Video looks really good, and I personally keep mine at 30 frames per second because I'm not a big 60 frames per second guy, but there you go. And of course, it's not going away anytime soon. We still have that camera bump, and I'm just begging Apple to get rid of it. Um, it's really annoying, but it's still here to stay. And Apple did upgrade the water and dust resistance on the XS to IP68, where previously it was IP67. So if you dunk your iPhone in water, it should be absolutely no problem at all. And the iPhone XS, of course, does support wireless charging. And technically it supports fast charging, but it's not as fast as some Android phones out there. But it's good to have nonetheless. And in terms of performance, we get the new A12 Bionic chip, which it is a screamer. I'm zipping through these web pages here. 
and loading up my website, which you should definitely check out. I have a lot of high resolution images on my website and it's just loading with no problem. And Apple does say that the new A12 Bionic chip is up to 15% faster than the iPhone 10 with the A11 Bionic. And that pretty much holds up true. And seeing here with the CPU performance and Geekbench 4, uh, we don't really see a lot of significant CPU gains. Again, with the previous iPhone 10, we got around 10,000 on the multi-score. And you can see here on the iPhone 10s, we're hovering around 11,000. So not a big CPU gain. But where we really see the performance is the graphics performance. Apple really beefed up the GPU this time around. So here I'm up opening up Lightroom and editing a 42 megapixel raw photo from my Sony a7R2. And it is just handling it like a champ here. No problems, no hiccups. Everything is smooth and really fast render times as well. And here is just some gaming performance. I'm playing Asphalt 9. It's a really graphics intensive app and you can see no problems at all, no hiccups. And honestly, playing games on here is a breeze, and it's really beautiful with that new OLED display as well. Now there is actually one glaring issue I have with the iPhone XS, and that's with the Wi-Fi speed. So here I'm showing you the Wi-Fi speed from my MacBook Pro, just to show you what I usually get. And it's just to sort of act as a control, so you can see I usually get around the upper 100s to around 200 megabits per second on the download speed. And then with the upload speed here, I usually get anywhere above from 300 or higher and yeah these are usually normal speeds that I get from the day to day but then when you hop over to my iPhone XS for some reason the speeds are always lower and sometimes even significantly lower than the Wi-Fi speeds on my MacBook so you can see here I'm hovering around 160 and then with the uploads I'm getting around 300 or 200 and it dips even lower than that and sometimes it's even worse than this. This is the Wi-Fi speeds I get on a good day. Uh, but you can see here, I managed to get it on camera. And you can clearly see on my iPhone, I'm getting really poor performance here, around 20 megabits per second on the down. And on my MacBook, I'm getting well over 100. And then with the upload speeds on my iPhone, I hover around 90 megabits per second on the up. And I'm getting well over 600 on my MacBook. And I contacted that Apple support. They couldn't help me with this issue. And I'm hoping it's not a hardware issue that I could still be fixed with software. The recent iOS 12 updates did not fix it for me, so honestly, tell me guys in the comments if you guys are having this issue with your iPhone, and uh, maybe it's just me and I have a faulty unit, but that's just the issue I have with this iPhone XS at the moment. But overall, the iPhone XS is still a good phone, um, again that Wi-Fi issue is kind of a sticking point for me, but the cameras are great, Smart HDR is a little questionable, um, but for the amateur photographer or normal person, this smartphone is still a great buy and I highly recommend it. And that concludes my iPhone XS review, so if you guys have any questions or comments, leave it down in the comment box down below. And if you like this video, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.